Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to start a new book today, the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel in the Hebrew tongue means, my God is El, but I would prefer to translate it, El strengthens me, or God, our Father, strengthens us. If you want to know where strength comes from, that's what the word Ezekiel means, is God will strengthen you. As a matter of fact, there are many things that can strengthen you for a short period of time. God will strengthen you forever, even for the eternity, if you come into his territory, into his uh, wonderful house. Uh, Ezekiel uh, took place about 484 B.C. You might take note of that, um, and, and it, this is with the 110-year correction that you will find in your companion Bibles in the chronological chart, but, and that, that would be the actual time. Uh, he was sent during the captivity, but God saw that you will find more concerning the millennium in this book of Ezekiel than you will in all of the New Testament put together. So it's very rewarding in that it informs us. And Ezekiel is the book that God saw fit himself, not just the Holy Spirit, not the Son of God, but God himself came, visited us, gave us a direct message in this book of Ezekiel. I mean, even brought the very altar of God with him. That's pretty impressive when you stop and think about it. Why did he do that? To strengthen us, to give us hope, whereby we see that that he provides for us and how precious it is. Ezekiel's reign will last about 21 years. That's three times seven, spiritual completeness. Uh, three sevens being 21. And what a fascinating book. Let's go with it. Chapter 1, verse 1, the great book of Ezekiel, God strengthens us. Verse 1 reads, Now it came to pass in the 30th year of the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kibar, that means a length, like a length of time, you might take it, that the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God. I mean, he saw him directly. That, that is so very unusual. But uh, verse 2, in the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. Now, many people get Jehoiakim mixed up with jo Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was the, was the offspring. He would be later, his name would be changed, as you will remember, to Jeconiah. And then when he was so disloyal to Almighty God, they would take away God's name and they simply call him Coniah, which is to say whom Yah has appointed, they would take the Yah away and just simply say appointed because he was appointed to something other than leadership. Uh, but his reign was only three months, so it was pretty short-lived anyway. Yeah, but that's what it's dated from, and that confuses some people because this would be C-H-I-N, and they confuse it with K-I-M being the final letters of Jehoiakim rather than Ken. Verse 3, the word of the Lord came expressively, I mean just especially, unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Bazai, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the river Kebar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And, I mean, in person. That, what an what awesome thing. You know, people talk about, like, I talked to God today, uh-uh. You never forget, when God speaks to you, it's not something you just frivolously pass off. You may pray, but when God appears and touches, it's an awesome, awesome experience. Verse 4, and I looked, listen carefully, I looked, what did he see? And behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud. 
and a fire enfolding itself and a brightness about it. And out of the midst thereof was the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Now, um, this was a vehicle you're going to find out. And we're going to have to do a little bit of translating with this. You with the uh, Strong's Concordances, I want you to document what I say. The word color, there's no such word in the Hebrew language as color. The word in the manuscripts is ayan, which is, looks much like our O, but it means the eye. It means you see. This is what I see. But now the color amber, that, that won't cut it. In other words, it almost takes away the real truth of color. Like if you see something amber, if it was the Shekinah glory alone, you may not see anything. But there was an actual object here. Not just amber, it was an object. I want to call the word up in Hebrew for you on the screen. In your Strong's Concordance, it's the word 2830. It's Kashmal. Okay, Kashmal. Of uncertain derivation, uh, rather, probably bronze or polished spectrum metal. In other words, it was highly polished bronze. It was translated as amber. That just doesn't cut it. I mean, he saw a vehicle. It was whirling, and it was highly polished bronze. The Shekinah glory shining off of it. What an awesome experience. Now, here you've got Ezekiel, who's probably never seen a wheel other than on a cart, an ox cart or a, a camel cart. And those wheels roll right along on the ground. Well, now he's seeing wheels here that are in the air. They're flying. And they're highly polished bronze. Do you see what the difference, do you see how much difference this makes that you're not just seeing a vision of color? There's an object there, and it's highly polished bronze. Verse 5. Also, out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. These are the zoi. Okay, the same zoon that you find in the New Testament. What do they do? They guard the altar of God. They're the cherubims. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. In other words, they had the shape of a man. What, what, what is cherub in the Hebrew tongue? It's K-R-B. And even in English, K-R-B is keep and grab and grasp and guard. This, this was their duty. Anywhere they are, the altar of God is. So let that take away any doubt you might have that the physical actual ark of God was in this vehicle, this highly polished bronze vehicle, because the guards thereof were also present. Verse 6. And every one, each of these four, every one of these faces had every, and, and every one had four faces, and every one had four wings. Now, don't, uh, understand, here we have a man that sees this highly polished object. It's flying. Every, everything he ever has ever known that flies has got to have a wing. Okay. So it's up there, and he's calling them wings. Verse 7. And their feet were straight, that means unjointed feet, and the sole of their feet were likened to the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkle like the color of varnished brass. Why? Because they were varnished brass. Well, what was this that let down and they landed on it? It was their landing gear. You know, it's real easy for us to visualize that today. It was difficult for them at that time. A straight leg with a pad on the end of it, like a hoof, to set down and naturally support the vehicle. No problem there. All you have to do is add a few years to what we know today. And through the eyes of Ezekiel, I think he did a fantastic job of describing this appearance of the living God. Verse 8. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. Now, this, this is going to sound a little strange to you, but hang on. Hang on for a moment. Verse 9. 
Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went, and they went every one straight forward. They were in perfect formation as they flew. Now, they looked not where they went. Again, have you ever ridden a horse, a donkey, an ox? Where you go, you're going to turn the head of the animal, and it's going to look where you're going, and you're going to turn that. These things didn't have a head. They didn't have to look where they went. They just simply went where they wanted to. Why? They were perfectly a perfect circle. And he did a fantastic job of pulling that straight so that you could see. And in perfect formation, as, as they moved, uh, I, again, for this to be 484 B.C., I think Ezekiel did a fantastic job delivering the description of this appearance. Next verse, please. Verse um, 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion. On the right side, they had four. They four had the, the face of an ox. And on the left side, they four also had the face of an eagle. Now, if you know anything about the nation Israel, you know this is God's way of saying, I've come to talk to my people Israel. Because this is the actual formation of the nation Israel in the habitation in which God placed them. To the north, Dan is the eagle. And to the east is the Lion of Judah. This is where the, tri the way the tribes protected each other at encampment. And to the south was a man which was the tribe Reuben. And to the west, of course, was an ox, and that was always Ephraim. So there's no big deal in that. If you, if you want biblical proof, read the second chapter of uh, read Numbers chapter 2, verse 10, and, and forward, and you'll, you'll see that for God lets you know what these faces mean, what these people mean in their encampment and in their privilege. So here we see the very Zun, or the representatives of the house of Israel. You know, many people, always to the east was Judah. This is one of the reasons that I could translate the Bat Creek Stone so easily. Because in the first string of letters, at the beginning of the string of letters, I should say, was a resh, which rather than pointing west, pointed east. Which, if you put yourself in the position of those that wrote it, which were priests buried there, you have to think as a priest. So, Elif, Resh Elif, is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And any, any scholar knows that. So, it made it quite easy to pick up and begin translating the string of letters in the Bat Creek Stone. Perfect Hebrew. Okay, so here you have the, the description, and you recognize the fact that God is coming to his people. His message will be for everyone, because through this people comes Christ, to whomsoever of whatever race, nationality, or language can have salvation. Verse 11. Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies, and they were enfolded. You know, they don't use, uh, we, we use um, fossil fuel to propel most any aircraft or thing that flies that we have today. And I assure you, this vehicle does not use um, fossil fuel. It has energy cells that are so very bright and that they teem within with power and might, with, and here to add to it the Shekinah glory. What, what does Shekinah mean? It means that God is there. Therefore, we see the beauty and the very bow itself of the prism of colors around our Heavenly Father. Verse 12, and they went everyone straight forward. They, they were in formation. 
whither the Spirit was to go, they went. And they turned not when they went. In other words, they didn't look where they, they just kind of went all together in formation. And where the vehicle went, those people went also. Well, now, wouldn't it stop and think? If you're in a car and the car turns, the people better turn too, or you got a problem. If you're in an airplane and the airplane turns, the people better turn with it. That's the spirits, okay? Verse 13, as for the likeness of the living creatures, these four zoom, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures and the fire was bright and out of the fire went forth lightning. This is the Zoe, and of course the presence of God and the Shekinah glory. It's, it, 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 the light is amazing. That Shekinah glory that lets you know the presence of God. Awesome. 14. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. They were quick. Zoom, zoom. 15. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. I saw one of them actually come to earth. It landed. 16. The appearance of the wheels and their work was likened to the color of burl. That's, that's to say sapphire. And they four had one likeness. And their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. He, he, like I said again, the only wheel he ever saw up to this time was on an, an ox cart, and it went by your side. These did not go by their side. They were flying, and they were off the ground. And it would appear to him there was a wheel in a wheel because of the huge circular movement uh, of this vehicle. You might say, well, I wonder why God had to have a vehicle. His throne is there. His altar. It needs transportation. If, and um, the Spirit of God can go anywhere, but God is here in person to Ezekiel to deliver a message to you, especially in these end times, especially because in this book of Ezekiel and the message he delivers covers more concerning the millennium, which you're going to have a great deal to do with, than any other book in the Bible. Father wanted you to know. So he came himself to see that this message was delivered properly. Next verse, please. 17. When they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. Again, having explained that, you understand. It's very difficult if you're used to seeing an old horse up in front of you looking to see where you go to just see something circular just moving whichever object it wants, never being able to tell which way it's going to go, that amazed him. 18, as for their rings, the outer ring, they were so high that they were dreadful. And their rings were full of eyes. There were windows in them. There were portholes there. Round about them, four. All four of them had windows that I could see inside. 19. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Because the wheels were lifting the creatures, and the creatures was, were in them, and they moved, and he could see through the windows, he could see them. <clears throat> it's no different than you looking in the window of an aircraft when it's taxiing or taking off, or if you fly along beside one. Wherever that airplane goes, those people are going to go. There's no big deal about that. Verse 20, whithersoever the Spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their Spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Meaning, being in them, naturally it moved with them. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think, again, 
we have a little bit of repetition in this, but you've got a man here in 484 B.C. painting you a picture today when you have all this vast knowledge of aircraft and, and missiles and uh, satellites and so on and so forth uh, in this great generation that we live in where many of these things, many of us have seen all these things come into being in, in, in one lifetime. But back then, to see him describe in such detail what was actually happening, I think is fantastic. Let's go with the next verse, please. 21. When those went, these went. And when those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Again, declaring that. And, um, and so it is. We're... Where it goes, they go. Why? It was in perfect formation. And do you know what? Do you know why you see such perfect formation? Discipline. God in control. Everything works smoothly and right to the detail. But why? Because God is giving the instructions. God is giving the orders. 22. And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creatures was as the color of terrible crystal. Uh, you, you know, um, uh, this word terrible should be translated reverence, okay? Um, reverence uh, crystal. I mean, it was beautiful. Awesome to look at is what it really means. Stretch forth over their heads above. Why? Because the Shekinah glory of the living God was present. Verse 23, and under the firmament were their wings straight. They were level. The one toward the other, every one had two, which covered on this side, and every one had two, which covered on that side their bodies. And he's describing this. They were moving. Uh, you know, to him, if it's flying, it's got to be a wing. All right? You can understand that. 24, and when they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of an host. When they stood, they let down their wings. They let down their landing gear. They settled. You know, the voice of the living God is awesome. And he comes again, as I stated, for a message to you today that you can see and understand and, and enjoy the very presence of God for telling us what is to come. For you can then understand better why Christ would say in Mark 13, hey, behold, I foretold you all things. And a lot of it is told right in this book, whereby you do not have to wonder, well, are, are there unidentified objects flying? Are there unidentified flying vessels? No, God knows what they are. They know what they are. We just don't. Unless you're familiar with God's Word, then you can kind of piece it together, and truth on truth, and understanding on understanding, yeah, well, then would all vehicles uh, be uh, friendly? No. You know the false Christ is coming back. It's, a, it's just like a car. It's according to who's driving it. That, that's really difficult to understand, is it not? No, it isn't. It's quite simple. We know the false Messiah comes first. He, doesn't, he, he may s assume he has an altar, but he doesn't. But he'll make a lot of people think he does. And he will also have to have transportation. Get used to it. Don't make a religion out of it, but understand the Word of God. You do believe God's Word, do you not? Verse 25, to continue. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. In other words, they had landed, 26. 
And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Who, who was it? must be your father. He didn't send someone. He came himself to bring you a message, to bring you the truth, whereby you didn't have to wonder about what tomorrow brings and all these stories about these objects and so on and so forth to give you clarity and understanding and maturity. And most of all, common sense to understand the Word of God and the prophecies and advents spoken of in this Word of God. He came himself. You know why? Because he loves you. He wanted you to receive the message. Verse 27. And I saw as the color of amber, there you go again. Was the, what was this color amber? Highly polished bronze. As the appearance of fire round about within, within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about it. This your kind of glory. You know, if you, if, if when you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. Have you never read Revelation chapter 1, verse 15 and 16? The appearance of Christ? It's the same thing. Described basically the same. That brilliant, that glory, that wonderment of seeing the Savior and the Father in that, in the presence of, with that, with that glory, and I'll repeat it again, Shekinah glory. And again, let me remind you again, what does the word Shekinah mean? A lot of people want to make a religion out of it. It just simply means God is there. So when God is there, you've got that Shekinah glory. You can count on it. It's always there. And how precious it is that our Father loves us enough. He strengthens us enough that he came himself to prepare us for what is ahead. With this great prophecy in this book of Ezekiel, El strengthens, our Father strengthens us with truth, and, and uh, with the destiny to fulfill our obligation to our Father in loving Him and carrying out His commands. Verse 28 to complete the chapter. As the appearance, as the appearance of the bow, th that means the prism of light that is around a rainbow. Have you ever seen one? Of course you have. That beautiful, anytime you see the, God's uh, altar and you see the presence of God, just as it is written in the fourth chapter of the great book of Revelation, you see that bow. As a matter of fact, I'll even go further yet. In chapter 5, you see the Antichrist riding on a white horse appearing, and he's got a bow, but it's a cheap fabric imitation. The word in the Greek is toxon. But here's the real thing. It's your father your Father that strengthens you in the beauty of the encirclement of light, that prism of light, the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. Looks just like that. So was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. It floored him. Now, God never talks to anybody when they're on their face. What he's about to do is to say, get up from there. You know, God doesn't particularly care for whips. And, and it's understandable the presence of God will knock you down. But you better get back up. And it's just like when God spoke to Job in, in um, Ezekiel chapter, um, Job chapter 38. He said, get up from there, gird yourself, and act like a man. And so it is. God loves men and women that serve him, that face him, that love him. But here, 
here we have this one, and, and understandably so. I mean, he's right in the presence. But what then happens? Well, let's go just a little bit into chapter 2 here, and let's find out. What is the message? Verse 1, chapter 2. And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. He won't speak to you until you do. Stand up and act like a man or a woman or a child of God. Verse 2. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me and set me upon my feet, and I heard him that spake unto me. Here comes part of the message. There's going to be a lot of it. Leadership. Direction. Verse 3. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel. Therefore you have the four faces in the explanation as I explain the encampment of Israel. To a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me, they and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this very day, and I will add until this day. And God sends this same message, meaning get your act together. God has given us the truth, he speaks the truth, and the message is coming. And it is as timely today as it was in 484 B.C. when God delivered it to Ezekiel, God strengthens us. It will strengthen you today. Because the message that he brings is written to those children. And what he's, what he's about to say, they probably won't listen to you, but you're going to deliver it anyway. Verse 4. And they, all, and they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. They're stiff-necked. They won't listen. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And so it is. No excuses, no ifs, no ands. God is saying this is the way it's going to be. Now, I don't know. Do you believe the Word of God? Then don't miss the next lecture. Let's see what he has to say. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?